Okay, well, uh, well, thank you, thank you for joining us. So I'm going to share my screen and I will start sharing. Um, So good evening, everyone. And for those of the, you that want to make sure, you know, the talk today is the tips to get your garden ready for the spring uh, season. So Min is my nickname. It just happened to be plant related, you know. So my name is Sajima Pasakli, and I'm one of the volunteer for the University of California Master Gardener. And for those of you that are not familiar with the program, it's a county-based program. So it's a volunteer-based program that we are certified volunteer. So we are based in Santa Clara, California, which is like, uh, this is Santa Clara County, but it's San Jose area, like Bay Area. So, so the talk today, you know, will sort of guide you to um, information that we have. And for those of you that have any question, you know, you, you may type your question on the chat and I will answer the question toward the end. And if I don't get to the question, because we expect about, you know, up to 200 people joining us today, uh, I will guide you to where that you will get the answer specifically for your garden situation. All right, and, thank, and thanks again for joining us. Mint, um, yeah, I have one reminder. Uh, yes, um, Mint will be trying to answer those questions. Please type your questions in Q&A bar, and that way we can uh, read easily your questions in Q&A bar. Thank you. At the end of the program. Thanks. So as I mentioned, um, I am a volunteer for the Santa Clara County. And this is a trained volunteer. So for those of you that are interested to uh, join our program, uh, we're training a trainer, you know, in the odd year. So again, you know, the, uh, it was postponed last year due to pandemic. And for those of you that live in, you must live uh, or res reside in Santa Clara County to become one of our volunteers. So if you live in California, you can check out your uh, local county program. So um, again, you know, um, we always welcome the, the new volunteers to join us. So like I mentioned earlier for some question that if I didn't get a chance to like uh, answer today and it's very specific for your own garden situation. Uh, you know, unfortunately we don't have a walk-in but we have hotline that you may call us Monday to Friday. And again, email is the best. Um, so you can Google Master Gardener Santa Clara County and then, you know, like, take a picture and wrote, write us an email and someone will get back to you in, you know, in a day or two. And for those of you that are new to our program, again, uh, we do send out a monthly email reminder about gardening tips, news, including the talk that's happening today uh, and in the future. So we do, we do not share your email with any uh, other program um, because we are county based program. So, so if you go to our website and you know, put down your email address, you will get that reminder, which is nice to kind of think about what to do in your own garden. And we have like demonstration and research garden that you can go visit. Again, you know, uh, for our program, we used to have this big sale twice a year, we call spring uh, garden market, which is usually happening in April and the fall garden market sale that usually happening in August. Again, you know, everything is pending right now due to pandemic. So we uh, recommend you to go support your local nursery because they do open, you know, for public um, sale. And for those of you, if you are, um, you know, interested to bring the garden to your um, children's school, or, you know, if you are also one of those teachers that want to learn more about school garden, we do also give you advice, uh, free advice on the school garden program. So just uh, go to our website and contact us. So I will start with the demonstration garden. So for those of you that live in the area, again, um, so this is kind of the list that, you know, in Bay Area. Before I go to that. So if you happen when you register to the program, there are two handouts that uh, I want to make sure that you get that because so then you don't have to take a note about my talk. I list everything. Um, so when you go to our Santa Clara City Library website, you know, on the talk today, you see at the end, there are handouts for the talk. So when you click on it, so one of them is a vegetable planning chart that I will go over it during my talk. 
And then another one is called Spring Garden Resort. So pretty much that's how I list all, um, you know, that's all the talk that, all the link for my talk will be on this, this, um, this piece of paper. So you don't have to worry about writing it down, okay? Back. So the demo garden in our area, you know, we have it from Sunnywell, uh, you know, San Jose, uh, and this is the name of the garden. So one thing that I like to recommend, you know, those beginner gardener, and for those of you that, let's say you want to redo your landscape and you want some idea, you know, it's nice to go take a look at the real garden. You, know, you can look through the magazine and stuff, but this is like the garden that will show you what actually growing well in your area. So check out your arboretum. You know, arboretum, sometimes they have some um, fancy plant, but, but it's best to go to the garden that utilize like native plants and such, you know. So this is kind of the link to the website that will, uh, you know, lead you to all this uh, garden. So one program that, uh, you know, for those of you that not aware of, you know, for our Bay Area, we have this uh, native garden tour. And it used to be like, you can go visit, uh, you know, the resident that um, offer the tour on that day, you know, unfortunately, again, you know, due to pandemic, now that they go, they go virtual. So if you go to the link to the website, um, <clears throat> it will show with you like the information about, you know, upcoming garden. So the 2021, it will happen pretty much uh, in April. So, you know, April, May would be the day. So, so this is the information about Gothic going native garden tour for 2021. And, and again, you know, this would be a great example that you can go look at someone backyard and they will share with you, you know, like how they start from scratch or how they turn their lawn to be a native uh, plants habitat. And, you know, you can grow some uh, flowers that attract like bees and butterflies, things like that. So that's like a good place to go take a look. So the outline of my talk today, you know, um, again, you know, we prepare our garden for spring. So I will go over what to expect, you know. So there are like uh, a few important dates for the area. So for those of you that are not within the area, I recommend you to Google or go to your local resource and then, um, you know, weed control. So that's applied to anywhere in the world, you know, pruning perennials, fruit training, and we will check out, you know, good bugs and bad bugs and also some other things like fertilizer and et cetera. So first of all, I like to start with, uh, you know, like for uh, you must know the weather or the microclimate in your, um, for your garden situation. So for California, you know, we happen to have this wonderful resource that we call California Climate Zone. And for the whole USA, you know, we have the US Department of Agriculture that you can also compare that to the climate zone for plant. And that also recommend you like, you know, what plant to grow or what plant you have to give special attention. So let's say that for those of you that like to have tropical or subtropical look, but if you live in the drier climate, you have to think about how to protect them because the dry air and the dry heat would, you know, make you a, um, some type of those plant, you know, um, susceptible to like uh, burning leaf or brownish or something like that. And then for talking about, you know, we planning our springs last summer, you know, for those like yummy heirloom, um, tomatoes, you know, bell pepper, um, anything that you like to grow. One way to start, you know, if you have your favorite um, farmers, you know, like the local farmer markets, it's a good place to check it out. And if you like, things that they grow, you know, you can ask them the type of, uh, or the what we call variety. So like, you know, whether it's heirloom or hybrid, but if you know that variety, you want to grow it on your own, that's, a, that's kind of the point of the good start to check it out. And again, you know, visit the local demo garden near you. So this is, you know, from the website here, the California Climate Zone, this is how it looked like. So when you think about it, you know, when you go shopping, you know, for like some of those perennial or tree, they would recommend that, you know, certain type of plant, you know, would grow well under this climate zone. So that's why, you know, it's important that for us to know, you know, 
our location and what actually grow best in our area. So again, this is only applied to Santa Clara County. So it's actually an average. <clears throat> so for, you know, uh, every year, you know, like today is February 18. Uh, you know, the last frost for our area is supposed to be on March 15, you know, on some years, you know, it can be showing up, you know, a day or two in April. But again, you know, so that's the average. And then today, you know, we have like, I believe it's like 62 degrees today. So it's beautiful out there and you can, you feel like you want to go start to do some work in your garden. So, um, you know, so it's nice and beautiful out here with the sunshine. But again, you have to remember, you know, the nighttime temperature is still below 40 at some area. So that's why, you know, you have to think about how you protect, especially the tender plants or the new transplant that you put in the, in your garden. So this is just kind of, um, you know, just the idea and example. So you can use the, the cloth type, you know, cover. Uh, you can buy specifically, you know, to, to sort of like protect the plant because they can get sunlight through the sheet and then, um, you know, at night, keep it nice and warm. And so this is an example from, uh, you know, a field community garden that uh, I visit. So like you, you can see that, you know, you can uh, utilize, uh, you know, sort of reuse this like two liter soda bottle that you cut half and then you can put it. So it keep the, the pea plant to be, you know, nice and warm. And then when they start growing big, you can open it up. And again, you know, like I said, when we got the frost um, or freeze advisory, you know, you wake up in the morning, you see this like little cheese of ice on the ground. So they can actually um, kill if you have the, the very young seedling. So you have to be careful. So the first frost for our area start in November 15. So again, you know, it's good to look at the uh, weather forecast when you are like one of those like avid gardener. And this is just to touch on like, um, you know, uh, overall for plant, you know, for the photosynthesis. That's how plant, you know, um, they, they can make their own food, you know, they use the energy from the sun, sun from the sun, and, you know, convert that uh, to be, you know, um, you know, like use carbon dioxide and that's convert that to glucose and release oxygen for us. So what we're feeding on the soil, you know, it's also important to know your soil. And then, you know, you use, uh, you know, like, you use compost, you know, to improve your soil quality, you know, you add fertilizer. Uh, I will talk about that toward the end, you know, like the different about um, various type of fertilizer. So next is about removing weeds, you know. So it's kind of one of those things that, you know, like as a gardener, right, we, we hate it, but again, you know, like it's part of the nature. So, uh, <clears throat> This year, you know, it's not quite a, a wet year. So like you probably can notice that the year that we got a lot of rain, you know, you probably get tons of this weed growing big on your yard. But this year we don't have that much rain, but still, you know, it's, there, there are some weed will still pop up. So again, you know, like the perfect time to remove weed are when the soil is still wet. So if you let the soil dry out, you know, it will get sort of to be painful to, remove them, right? Because the soil too dry and in, the, in our valley, the soil ha have a higher clay content, which means that it's hard to dig with your hand. So, so when the next rain come, you know, or for the area that you can keep the, that area still moist, so please dig it up. Because think about it, you know, that's a dandelion. The one flower, you know, the flower head can, you know, like produce all this, this little seed can grow another new dandelion plant. So you can, you know, for one flower, it can produce up to 1000 seed. And then again, it can spread everywhere. So the key is that, you know, you need to mulch it. <clears throat> so the best way to mulch, the best time to mulch is actually in the fall. So you keep the mulch down, you know, or before the big rain. So then the, the rain will set up the mulch and just keep the weed away. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is kind of the, just a big picture sort of to show you that what, you know, we call it seed bank cycle. So the seed, you know, that vary in the soil, you know, every time you dig the soil up, you know, they will show up and they will start grow again. So, you know, like they are, they always seed in the soil and most of them are weed seed, you know, so that's kind of part of their 
uh, surviving mechanism. So then unfortunately, every time you dig up the soil in your garden, you will bring up the weed seed. So that's why it's important to keep the mulch down. So, so then you, know, you get the weed um, under control. So this is like one of the sort of like, you know, uh, popular or things that you recognize from the garden, right? This is how like they show up about this time and, you know, they start blooming pretty soon, you know, with the perfect condition, you know, with, um, so you see how like they start forming the, the seed head. So this uh, oxalis, so they have that yellow flower and you see how like, uh, if you look through the diagram here, you see how they grow, right? So then if you just cut one part out, they can still keep growing. So, and again, if you end up, you know, like one of these year, you got too busy and you let the seed, you know, let the flower become seed and the seed dry out, you will pretty much, you know, like have uh, 10 times more the following years. So that's why it's important to get ahead of them if you want to keep everything, you know, under control. And again, you know, we recommend them to like minimize the use of uh, herbicides, you know, even though that's also another option to easily and faster to kill weed. But again, if you want to keep your uh, backyard to be, you know, like, um, you know, um, chemical free and, you know, organic, the best way to do it would be, you know, to, to dig it up. Um, it would be a good activity for family, you know, if you have little kids, you know, they like to pull weed. So that would be fun to go out and do that. So another uh, type of weed we call grass family. So the grass family, you know, again, they have all these like stolon and rhizome. So if you can dig them up, all, dig them all up, they're not gonna regrow. Really but again, it can be easily like the picture that they can keep growing everywhere. So it's carp, you know, one of those that you, um, you need to be on top of them because otherwise when they start growing big, you know, that's how they compete for food and nutrients and water from the bean or the tomato that we grow. So that's why it's important to keep the weight under control. And this is another way to keep the weight down, you know, we call, um, you know, do it yourself cardboard mulching. So if you, um, I, I do have the link on my handout, you know, uh, that detail how you do it. But the idea is like, you know, you can put the mulch, which is like, you know, this is another way to reuse all this box that we order from Amazon. Um, you know, we cut it down and you lay it around your plant. And then again, you know, like make sure that there is no hole because all this little hole that the sun can shine on, you can get the new weed pop up. Uh, there are the commercial grade that you can order, you know, so that's like, you know, the uh, professional landscaper, they use that kind when they do the front lawn, but you can just easily use them the cardboard. And then when you put it down, right, you put, um, you know, and then on top, you lay another mulch layer. So that would help, um, you know, to keep the weed down. And you need at least, you know, like uh, pretty much an inch depth or more. So the more depth is better. So then, you know, that's how you control the weed on the long term. So next we're gonna to shift to talk about, you know, the annual versus uh, perennial plants. So uh, just the idea that when you go shopping, you know, like uh, at the nursery, you know, there are annual plants that, you know, they really, um, you know, so they, which mean that the, you, you have to plant them annually because when they start, um, when, they, when the flowers um, will, you know, or at the end of their life cycle, you know, they produce seed and they're not growing back which is like comparing to perennial, you know, they, they keep coming back as long as you maintain them well. So the, the annual, they're setting seed, you know, some of them might reseed it, but again, you know, they are the one that has all this nice color that you can buy uh, from the gardening uh, center and then you can plant it as a border. And usually they sell in, uh, you know, like the multi six pack or four pack um, and they cost less. But the perennial is the one that lasts longer and they become like a big bush. So for example, lavender, rosemary. So then, you know, you don't, you only need one plant for like, let's say three or four square feet area. So that's carb to keep uh, in mind. And for our area, you know, like you can tell that now that the weather pattern, you know, start getting to be warmer. 
So I do not recommend you to prune too early because uh, you know, like we have a few, uh, almost another month before the last frost advisory, but because the thing is, if you prune it, those plant that nice and green and tender will expose to the, the frost if it's happened again. So you want to wait until sort of like, you know, after March 15 before you prune it. But if we happen to have this unusual warm uh, weather pattern, you can also start pruning it. So like you see from the picture on the right corner here, uh, it looked like it's a dead bush of, you know, big grass perennial here. They actually not die. If you prune out all the brown leaf, you know, they will come back. And again, you know, this one looked like, you know, one of those um, perennial bush, like either Sylvia or something. So they, if you cut all the brown stuff out, the green one will grow up. And also for the perennial uh, flowers, it's good to keep that we call dead heading, which means that you keep uh, clipping all the brow of the old flowers out because when the flowers start setting seed, um, they will you know stop producing the new flowers. So if you want to keep you know to have all this like you know uh, the show flowers uh, stay longer and you know have it keep coming, so you have to uh, clip out all the dead flowers out. So next is about fruit tree. So for the fruit tree, you know, we call fruit thinning. So for those of you that uh, have a tree fruit on your backyard or ever wondering like why my peach never get as big as the one that I got from Safeway or Costco, right? So this is actually what they do on the commercial orchard. So when you have a, you know, like after all the blossom turn to become the fruit, you don't leave all this fruit on the branch, you know, because the, the recommendation is that, you know, you leave about three or four inch space on this branch. So then each fruit will grow bigger. So unfortunately, you know, you have to thin them. So that we call uh, fruit thinning. And you see how like they leave it out. Oh, sorry, it's four to five inch between. So this is like one of the example for like, let's say peach. The apricot or cherry could be smaller uh, space because they are smaller fruit. But all those thinning, you know, you can put it back on the ground as a cover or you can just use it on your compost pie but it's kind of you know like it looked dramatic that you have to pick out that many fruit but that's how you're gonna if you want the bigger size of fruit that's how you do it um so next is how to protect the tree you know now we on the tree fruit so we have this um you know like it's not quite common for our area because we, we don't, don't get as hot as, um, you know, like in the valley or the desert area. But um, if you drive to the central valley, you might notice that uh, along the, the orchard, you know, all this tree has this white paint on the trunk. So that's how we call it, you know, like um, they call, um, excuse me. So the reason they paint the white color is actually to to protect the sun, uh, protect the tree from the sunburn. So the tree, you know, the tree trunk, you know, when they're exposed to the sun, and if it's very strong sun, you know, or the heat stress, they can, you know, the bark will split and then it will come all this, you know, like it would expose the, the pretty much the tree skin, you know, to insect damage. So that's why, you know, they, the reason that they paint white color, um, they apply the white interior latex plant paint that they dilute it with is a one-to-one -one portion with water, and then you paint it over um, the tree trunk. And then if anything happened, you know, like let's say that that year you, um, you know, it was windy and the top of the tree fell off, you know, you protect the trunk and the, the plant can grow back that way. So, so there is a link here that it will show you about like, you know, how they do it. So they call why washing the trunks. So it's, it's common for commercial lands, um, orchard, but again, you know, if you happen to have the tree fruit and you live up on the hill or, or where that you get very, you know, um, the sun exposed to the sunlight and might get sunburn, you know, we recommend that. So next is about uh, soil temperature and air temperature. So when you, you know, planning for your garden, you know, you, can, you have that option, right? So you can plant from the seed, you know, you direct seed and often seed uh, cost less than seedling, which is that you go buy, you know, six pack from uh, the nursery. So, so then, but there are like 
advantage for starting from transplant or seedling. Let's say that, you know, you can, it's, it's easier because if you want to only grow like five or six type of tomatoes in your garden, you know, it's better to just uh, go by the seedling of the transplant instead of starting from seed because if you actually want to start the tomato from seed, by now you should actually start like have it, you know, in your sort of like um, indoor container because the tomato seed takes a long time to grow. So now like for me, you know, I have the seed that I saved from last year from a few of heirloom variety that we like. So I already start my plant and they're about like half an inch tall. So I'm not gonna plant outside until the weather sort of warmer, but now I started uh, indoor. And one of the handout that you guys have is this, uh, you know, the planning chart that I like to go over. Uh, so this is kind of the, um, you know, this is the website, but the one that you have is on PDF. So, you know, on our website, it does have this nice color coding. So it's the, we call vegetable planning chart. So then, you know, like uh, it does have this, uh, you know, why as a yes, should work, no, not recommended and P possible. And when you go down, you know, um, so let's say that, you know, if you want to uh, grow a tishok, you know, so we said for transplant, you start since September, October, you know, not now because, you know, that's not the time. And it takes 12 weeks to get the artichoke. So for arugula, you know, for those of you that have it, you know, you can start direct seed, um, you know, like in March, April. Uh, the one that I have in my garden, I did direct seed around October. So now they actually get bushy and even start um, producing flowers for arugula. But if you get the transplant from the nursery, you know, you can plant it now. So they, they, they okay for the cold temperature, you know, they sort of, they're one of the, we call cool season crop, which is like arugula, broccoli, like bok choy, you know, you can, you can plant the transplant right now, you know, in February. So you can see how like, and then even direct seed, you know, you can do that. But again, direct seed, you have to be careful because if we have some sort of like, you know, frost uh, advisory at night, you, you need to protect the seedling because they can get, um, um, you know, like the freeze damage, as you know, it can burn. So look like the plant look turn brown and die. So just have to be careful with that. And again, you know, we have the whole list of, you know, pretty much like alphabetical, you know, two things that you will grow. So let's say that, you know, like, um, we all love to grow um, tomatoes. So, where's tomato? So this is tomato. So again, you know, like we recommend to use transplant, uh, not direct seed, right? So then, you know, you plant it, you know, um, in April, pretty much, you know, like, so that's how you plant it. So that would be the tomato that's about, you know, like 10 inch, you know, six to 10 inch tall. And then, you know, like uh, for those of you that have the tree fruit, um, so there are fruit trees and then they talk about, you know, the chill hours, which is slightly related to, you know, like when they're gonna produce a fruit and, um, you know, so then, um, you know, this is a good resource about like all the fruit tree, you know, that I'm not gonna go over it, but at least you have like, again, you know, the handout would, would has um, the link to this information. Oh, and another very good reference would be garden catalog. So if you can get the garden catalog, you can look through like and read more about the type of variety of plant that you want to grow more in detail, you know. So speaking about use, uh, growing from transplant, um, this is kind of a good example for tomato. So you can see on your screen, you know, like the incorrect way to plant it would be you plant, you know, you cover that leaf, you know, so those leaf has to be above the soil line. So if you have the plant, you know, make sure you look for that, that we call first true, first leaf or cotyledons. So those has to be like above the soil line when you plant it. So, so that's how in general, you know, for any plant that you got from the nursery. However, if you get a tomato, um, you know, like for tomato, there is an except, exception. So if you remember, you know, tomato has all this like hairy sort of like skin on there. 
uh, leaf and the stem. So those little hair, you know, actually gonna grow to be a root. So when you get the tomato plant, even though they look a little bit, you know, like um, um, tall and leggy, we recommend you to bury them up to here. So you see the big picture of tomato, right? So then you trim all this out and you bury it here. So all the root, uh, all the hairy area is gonna grow to be a root and the, the tomato will become a big and strong and produce a lot more fruit that way. So next we will talk about, you know, the insect in our garden. Um, you know, we, we had this talk a couple months back that um, if you go to um, our website, you know, there was a, there was a YouTube clip that um, it's a, actually another one hour of lecture, but this is called where you can get reference, you know, from uh, the information from them, from our, um, our link. So what I want to show you here is like pretty common, right? So this is the time that if you look, look at your rose bush or if you have kale uh, or broccoli, you know, they start showing up. So this is the time that we have tons of this uh, aphid. So the aphid will show up this time of the year because they like that nice and warm afternoon and cool night. And if you happen to have lady beetles, lady beetles or ladybugs in your garden, they would come and eat all the aphid. However, you know, like we like you to make sure that you recognize, you know, like everyone recognizes the ladybugs, but this is what it look like, you know, for their larvae state, you know, for the eggs. And then when they're little, they look kind of funny. Like some people mistake them, thought that they are bad guys, but this is like, we call them, um, it look like a baby alligator, but they will become the ladybugs. But again, you know, for ladybugs, you know, for all the state, they do eat like tons of aphids. So that's why people, you know, like some of the garden center, they sell um, live ladybug. And if you happen that you never seen one in your garden, we recommend you to get them because it will be a good start to introduce them to your garden. But make sure that you read the detail carefully, you know, how you release them. And you, it's best that you have like some type of shrub or flowering plant in the area for them. Otherwise they might fly and you know, stay in your neighbor yard instead of your yard. So you want them to stay in your garden. So that's kind of a tip about, you know, like getting ladybugs and having them in your garden. So they do eat like, you know, all this effort. And for effort in general, the easy way it can be just, you just use a high water pressure and, you know, um, and spray them because the aphid would drop on the ground and the, you know, the ground critter would eat aphid. So, so that can be that simple. And this is kind of like, you know, uh, this is a very nice um, image that, you know, like I would recommend you if you want of those that, you know, like in the garden, so you can recognize all this, um, you know, the, this is the poster of the beneficial or the good box in your garden. And, you know, we have like less swing, you know, and this is like their baby state. And there are other things in the garden that actually benefit because they do eat all those bad bugs in your garden. And then, so for our program, you know, the UC IPM website, they have tons of information. So this is the one I mentioned about aphid. And when we call aphid, you know, they're quite plant specific, which means that they look different, like they would be like gray on the rose or light green on the carrot or something like that. So, so they are like the, this one is called woolly apple aph aphid that you might notice that, you know, they're showing up on your apple tree. So they also aphid type, which means that, you know, ladybug will eat them or you can spray high water pressure on them. Uh, you know, that would be pretty much simple way to control them. Okay, so we talk about the life cycle of a ladybug. <clears throat> Next, you know, would be uh, how to like nurture your soy. So um, for those of you, you know, like that, uh, that have a backyard and you have some room, you know, making compost is the best way to recycling nutrient back to the soy. And then, you know, you make your own fertilizer, um, you know, 
So you avoid adding those weed seed, uh, you know, in compost bin. So the weed seed should go to your green bin. And for those of you that are new to the area, you know, for our county, again, you know, we have another sort of sister program with Master Gardener, we call Master Composter. And this is the link to the website that um, now that also, you know, we go virtual, um, the county has, um, has a program that after you attend the class, you know, different city has a different subsidy program. Let's say if you live in Cupertino, you might be able to get a free compost bin for the first time that you, um, you know, you, you get it from the city. City of Santa Clara, you can get it like half price. So this Saturday, the city of Santa Clara will host a, a talk that I will give a talk with my um, uh, co-teacher. Um, so we're gonna talk about worm bin and how to start uh, your own worm bin. So this is a website that you can go register to get the information. So this is the composting education program. So we have the, all the talk are on Saturday morning because we used to have it in person, but we keep it that way, even though most of them become virtual. So you must attend the class in order to purchase the discount bin from the program. And we do give advice to school and, you know, like uh, for some of those schools, you can get in touch with us and we, we do presentation, you know, for school as well. So this is the compost information. So when you talk about compost, you know, they um, compost give, you know, help fertilize the soil, but they're not as strong as the fertilizer that you can buy in the back. So what fertilizer does, you know, they do give that extra boost for plant growth and development. But then, you know, when you apply fertilizer, you should think about, you know, like just say that, you know, when the plants are small, they don't need uh, fertilizer at all. But when they start getting bigger, that's when you start adding fertilizer. So you have to have, keep that in mind, you know, so you don't over fertilize. And um, for our area, you know, the runoff can go to, um, it flow to the bay. So that's how, you know, it's bad that, you know, if it's like, you know, uh, if the high fertilizer content mix in the water and run to the bay, that's how we get those like, you know, uh, water pollution. So we recommend you read the labels when you apply fertilizer. So there are like various type of fertilizer, you know, so they come in the solid or pellet type, you know, powder or liquid. And then, you know, the synthetic or chemical based fertilizer, which is often, you know, use it as a lawn fertilizer. And people, you know, like recognize that brand miracle Grow, you know, and they are high nitrogen content. That's why you don't use a lot. And then when, you, um, when you look at the label, they are salt based, which means that the longer you keep using in your garden, the salt content will get, you know, accumulate and start rising. So you have to be very careful for long-term use of synthetic or chemical fertilizer in your garden because, you know, the soil um, is also impacted by biological activity in the soil. So that's why, you know, we recommend using yeah, like compost, you know, or natural based um, fertilizer, or we call organic fertilizer. So the way that we look into it or look at it, uh, you know, um, let's see, sorry. I will talk about like how to read the label, but the organic or natural based fertilizer are those manure, compost, um, fish powder, alfalfa alpha meal, cotton seed meal, etc. And then when you look into it, they, there is a, on the label that I will show you later on. Um, they will tell you where it came from. So for soil conditioner and soil amendment, you know, so for compost, like I said, you know, they're not, they give um, plants some boost, but they, they, their nutrient content is low, but because of the compost has this um, humus material that actually is boosted by biological activity. So when you keep adding compost over years, you probably notice that your garden bed soil become more like fluffy and, you know, like look like, you know, a live soil and, you know, smell nice and, so that's kind of the benefit of using compost in the soil. You can, um, you know, use edge manure and sometimes they call, you know, like they sell it on the back that look like compost, but they are edge manure, which means that they scrape out this manure, but they didn't go to the composting process. So they can, they do have some sort of like, uh, we call anaerobic smell, which means that, you know, like it still stinks in the way. And then sometimes because 
it's an old manure, you can still use it, but they come with all this weed seed that mix into it because they didn't go through that heating process. And that's why they cost less as well. Um, there are a store braille that you can utilize on your garden. And then, you know, some of those decomposed wood chip. So for those fertilizer and compost, you know, like there are like, um, when you look at the back, there are three number that, you know, like this three number is represent nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So it's N, P, and K. So, so the nitrogen is related to like, you know, the leaf. So if you want the plant to be nice and green and, you know, like leafy green lettuce, you look into fertilizer that add more nitrogen to the soil. And then phosphorus is about root, you know, so it's encouraged like uh, root growth and blooming, which is flowers. Um, flower is a K, which is a flowers is, um, excuse me. So um, the phosphorus will be, you know, the root part. So then when the root structure is, you know, healthy, the plant will grow bigger. And then K is phosphorus, which is a flower inducer or fruit maker. So like for those of you that has like tree fruit, you have to look into the fertilizer that um, providing uh, potassium uh, to the soil. Um, so this is for example, you know, like in general, the organic based fertilizer, we have the lower number because they are natural based. So the way you look at it is like, it would say derived from, this one is from dry poultry waste, uh, blood meal, feta meal, you know, uh, sulfates and potassium is like mining. So it's a natural based product. And then they give like 8% nitrogen, 2% potassium and 4% phosphorus. So, so that's kind of one way to look at, you know, and th for this one in particular, the organic farmer, they can use it commercially on organic farm because they recommend it to, you know, there is a label or stamp on it. But then if you look into like, you know, for this one, you know, um, similar to miracle grow, but this is a water soluble all purpose plant food. So this one is 24, eight and 16. So you can see how, you know, the number is a lot higher because they're, high, they're highly concentrate. So when you use it, you must read the label. And they always say like, you know, keep out of reach of children, you know, because they can become, you know, highly like toxic or bad, you know, impact our health. So they derive from ammonium uh, sulfate, potassium phosphate. So this is a uh, cell based product that, um, Again, like I said, if you keep using it years after years, it might it will impact your soil quality and um, the living organism that live in the soil. So, so <clears throat> when so when you use it, you know, make sure that you use it uh, with caution. And then, if you can avoid using it, it would be even better. So this is how you know, like I mentioned earlier. So the first number is nitrogen, second is phosphorus, and uh, the last one is potassium. So this one is like, you know, 10%. So if you have a 50 pounds bag, this bag would have like five pounds of each. And then, you know, they do mix the fertilizer with those uh, filler, you know, like sand, limestone or other things, because otherwise it, it will come, become too concentrate to use. So I think that's about it. Um, we have some time and I can take questions. So let me look at. Um... Thank you so much, uh, Mint. Let's see. Oh, you're welcome. So yes, we have some right. questions in, yeah. um, in Q&A. Let's start okay. with Q&A. OK, sure. Yeah. So the slide, um, you know, we record the, the talk, you know, like, but again, I said all the link that on my slide is on the handouts. So you should be able to access that to the handout, okay? And let's see. Oh, so the question about are these dandelion uh, edible? Well, okay. So the dandelion, you know, you can, there are the variety that they sell it on farmer market as a salad. So I believe that they're different kind from the one that you get from your garden uh, on your lawn. But again, you know, for me, I only grow it from the seed that for edible. <clears throat> I was told that you can eat the one from your lawn, but again, you know, the thing is about the lawn, the dandelion on the lawn or on the park. When you think about it, you know, like um, 
if you apply any chemical type uh, fertilizer on the lawn, it would stay in the dandelion. I wouldn't eat anything that if you treat your lawn with chemical that it can impact your health, you know. But again, there are edible dandelion that you can get from farmer market or grow your own. So I hope that makes sense. Let's see, the next question is, uh, do you recommend sowing seed indoor in a well-lit part of the house? Uh, I would say yes. So if you start, uh, you know, the seed indoor, you need the good light. Um, you know, if you have grow light, it went better because if you don't have enough light uh, and grow it on the dark corner, the seedling will stretching and that's, that's what we call unhealthy seedling. So, so you have to be careful with that. So you can sow the seed, you know, and then if you are, happen that, you know, if it's a nice warm day, you can put it outside and bring it back at night. You know, I know it's cumbersome, but that's the, the option to do it if you don't have grow light to keep the seed um, stay healthy and not stretching. So when I mean stretching, you, if you see the plant that look kind of like leggy and elongate, you know, they're not a good seedling. So don't buy those and don't, yeah, don't plant those in your garden. The plant will stay unhealthy. So the question is about the, do you wait until March 15 for fruit tree pruning? So for fruit tree pruning, you don't have to wait that long. Um, you can prune any time now. However, I would prune it on the dry day because you don't want to prune it on the wet day because every time you cut that wound, there is a chance that those wounds will susceptible to like, you know, disease. So you want to prune it when we have like at least three days of no rain and prune it in the morning so it's dry out during the day. So that, that's a recommendation for like pruning the tree. 